Hey guys, Arlisha here and welcome to another video. Today I have a painting to share with you, an acrylic painting like this one, and I'm also going to be answering a bunch of your questions. One thing I love about loose paintings like this, especially in opaque mediums, is if you kind of zoom in on a small area, a specific area, you can't really see what's going on. And it's only when you look at everything all together as a whole that it makes sense. And you can appreciate the small little bits for the ways that they work together. To be honest, that's kind of how this Q&A is going to go. I have a new acrylic painting to share with you, so you guys can watch this painting come together while I do my best to answer as many of your questions as I can. I want to say thank you to everyone who left a question over in the community tab when I asked if there was anything that you guys wanted to know, and I was kind of thinking it's been a while since we've done something like this, so I thought that could be fun. Before we jump into actually answering questions, I just want to let you guys know what supplies I'm going to be using today. So just like with this first painting that I did here, I'm going to be using hot press watercolor paper. I think this is the Canson Heritage hot press watercolor paper. And I had used some Arteza acrylics before, but I'm going to be using some heavy body acrylics for this new piece. I just wanted to see how they were different, how they felt to me, and just kind of experiment with some slightly different colors. I have this butcher tray that I'm using as a palette. Works really great for acrylics. The paint comes up nicely. Once it's dry, you can just kind of peel it off. And I will be using some pretty simple synthetic brushes. I will leave as many links to the products as I can down in the description. This painting process is going to be relatively real time, meaning that none of the footage is sped up. I've cut out the parts of the video where I was mixing colors or trying to get the right shade, so you're just going to be seeing the paint going onto the paper, still in real time, but not the full length of how long it took me to create this piece. Interestingly enough, cutting out the parts where I was mixing paint ended up being about half of the total amount of time, so only about half the time was spent actually painting, and that's what you're going to be seeing here. I'm going right in with my acrylics and kind of sketching out the basic form here. To be honest, I wish I had used a round brush or even like an angled brush to do this as I'm not as familiar with flat brushes and I had some issues right away with my underlying sketch that I ended up having to fix way later on in the painting, but you'll see those when we get to it. To start, I wanted to answer some of the simple questions that you guys asked about me and then we'll get into more of the art advice. So you guys wanted to know when I started making art, when and why. I've always drawn ever since I was little, I've always loved to draw, which I know a lot of people say, but I didn't really take art seriously and draw for the purpose of learning to get better until about three years ago. It was actually July of 2016. I remember writing July 1st, 2016 in the first sketchbook that I got, and I was largely inspired by some YouTube artists that I really, really admired at the time, like Mark Crilly and Jazza. So it's been about three years that I've been doing art seriously to learn and grow, as opposed to just doodling when I was in school. Before I was an artist, I did have other jobs. I actually never grew up thinking that I was going to be an artist. One of my favorite jobs was actually working in libraries. I worked at a college library and then a public library. I loved doing that. I loved not just the books, but the community of it, and that was fantastic. I actually went to college to teach high school biology, which was what I wanted to do for a really long time. Some of you had asked if I went to art school, and no, I did not. But I did go to college to teach high school biology, which I actually never finished. I did actually drop out of college because I got the job at the library and I loved it and it was full time and it was good and I decided that I wanted to just stick with that, which I did until my first child was born and, and lots of things have changed since then. In case you're kind of new to this channel and you don't know, I am 28 years old. I actually just turned 28 on September 1st, which was a few days ago, so this is my first time. Uh, I think this is the first time that I've said I'm 28 years old. So yeah, I am. I'm married and I have two beautiful little children, a girl and a boy, and they are six and four, or at least they will be this week because both of their birthdays are within one week of mine, so it's lots of fun birthday time together as a family, which is really cool. Okay, I think that covers most of the personal stuff. Let's jump into some art questions. The first one that we're going to 
cover is one that's really important to me and you guys may have seen it in the title of this video and that's the general idea of what if my art is bad and this fear accompanies other things that you guys had questions about like being your own worst critic or being afraid to use your art materials and i'm sure a lot of you can relate to this feeling when you sit down and you want to make something new but you're so afraid that you're going to do it wrong or that it's going to be bad and sometimes this can result in not doing anything at all. For me personally, when I feel this way, and I think that this can apply to a lot of other people as well, when I'm worried that my art will be bad, I'm way too often automatically associating making art with sharing it online. Before I've even started making the art, I'm still sitting here in front of a blank piece of paper and I'm already worrying about what people are going to think about it. And sometimes that translates into literal things like how many likes it will get or how many comments or and down into these tiny little minute details, which is a real shame and I think can be an awful, awful thing to establish as a habit as an artist, especially for younger artists. We should never learn how to make art while developing insecurities about social media and sharing our art online at the same time in tandem. We need to be able to learn independently and then if we decide to share that learning, then that can be what we share online. I have a lot of thoughts and a lot of opinions when it comes to social media. I've actually been strongly considering over the past couple weeks not even using Instagram anymore, even though it's been an amazing tool for me in audience building and getting to connect with people on more of a regular daily basis about little things in between videos. It's been so bad for my mental state that I, I, I'm not really sure if I'll be sticking around there much longer or I might be able to develop a healthier use habit which is something to be honest I've been trying to do for like two years and it never works because I have a problem <laughs> and a lot of insecurities that social media sites like Instagram tend to just feed and cultivate instead of allowing me to address these things in a healthy way. So anyway, the first question that I would ask you is, are you separating the creation of your art from the sharing of your art? If you're automatically making those things into one thing, that can be a big, big problem. Of course, we want to have people who can give us advice and feedback on our art, but automatically going, I'm going to try to make something, but it has to be good so people will like it. That's not a mentality that's actually going to help you to learn. When you're looking to be a professional and you want your art to be accepted by galleries or you want clients to like the work that you're making, that's different. That's not the same thing. But when you're just looking for validation in the creation of art on a very fundamental level, that's an exceptionally unhealthy place to be. So we need to separate the creation of art from the sharing of art. And we need to be able to create art explicitly for the purpose of learning. Imagine if you were afraid to write in your own diary or personal journal because you were afraid of what other people would think of you based on what you wrote there. Well, that would be a silly thing because diaries are meant to be personal and private. When you are writing in a journal that's just your personal musings and thoughts and feelings, that's not for anyone else. Generally speaking, it's for you. And there has to be some part of art that falls into that category as well. I know that I need times where I'm making art just to learn, just to figure something out or just to explore something. Learning about the texture of certain paints or how certain colors work together, trying to create a particular color palette, and I need to have the freedom to do that without just sitting around and worrying what other people are going to think about my art. So what if you make art and it's bad? Well, here's the truth. It will be. Sometimes it will be. And to be honest, a lot of times it will be bad. But that's a good thing. Making bad art is so important. And overcoming the fear of making bad art is really about more of a 
mentality shift than getting better at art and getting to the point where you don't make bad art anymore. Everybody makes bad art. And I don't really want to get into the definition of what good art is and what bad art is. I think a lot of that has to do with what I said earlier about social perception and how other people see our art. Making something that isn't a masterpiece is just a part of learning. Think about doing figure drawing scribbles and studies or just learning how colors work together on a page. That's not going to be a masterpiece of a spread in your sketchbook, but it needs to be there. It's important. You may have heard the phrase, we learn more from our failures than from our successes. And that's exceptionally true in the art category. When I'm looking at a piece, like you'll see later on with this one, I started to think that it wasn't working. And the fact that it was quote unquote bad actually helped me way more than if it was good right away. In seeing that there were issues with this piece, in seeing that it was bad when I stepped away from it the first time, I was able to learn. I was able to go, ah, I see what's wrong with this painting. I see where I made a mistake and I fixed at least some of it. I'm much, much happier with the final result of this piece than what I thought was going to be the final result earlier on. So bad art is a good thing. We need places where we can try ideas and experiment with scribbling all over the place because we need the creative freedom to do that and to learn and to grow. Bad art is just about learning. And we can't just skip wanting to learn and jump right into how do I become famous on Instagram. If you're constantly looking at your art in light of the art of people that you admire most, and that's not a constructive thing where you're analyzing how you can learn and grow, you're literally just going to destroy yourself. So if you need to stay step away from social media, do it. If you need to not look at those things for a little while and just sit down with your own mind and your own sketchbook and see where you're at, please, please do that. What helps me a lot is thinking of every piece as an opportunity to learn and experiment. I've talked about this a bit before in other videos and when we do live streams and things like that, but this has been revolutionary for me in how I create art and how I become more satisfied with every piece that I make, whether it's quote unquote good or not. Like I said, I've been thinking about every piece as an experiment. Like in science, I'm testing a hypothesis. That may make it sound very analytical and objective, but it's not really. So I may sit down for a particular piece and go, I wonder what would happen if. And then in the painting, I try to answer that question. So for this painting, I had seen a reference image where I loved the lighting. It was very strong daylight and the shadows on the character were so warm where they were bouncing off and kind of hiding in the skin. And I wanted to see what would happen if I started with a really strong red underpainting color and just tried to maintain that strong lighting as a focal point for the piece. So I had a question and I answered it. But like I said, it's not all about logic and answering questions and testing hypotheses. If I can't get into the right emotional and mental state, the art won't happen. I'm definitely not the kind of person who can push through a painting and be happy with the result when it comes to my mental state. For example, on Friday, I thought I would continue this series of acrylic paintings, sat down with a fresh piece of paper and some new paint, and ended up just scribbling all over it and throwing it in the trash because I just wasn't in the right mental state for creating. And I know that this doesn't apply to everyone, but it really, really does to me. If I'm feeling especially anxious or if I'm very down about something or sometimes it's not even about anything, I usually can't connect very well with my creativity. And so the creation of my art is usually linked very closely with a healthy mental state. We'll get more into that when I talk about how I stay motivated. The other aspect of this art fear that I wanted to talk about was when you feel like you're your own worst critic. When I'm sitting down and I feel like I'm judging myself harder than anybody else even would, I tend to ask myself three questions. One, can I fix it? So 
I'm kind of analyzing my mental state at this point too. I'm looking at a piece and going, do I know what needs to be done to make this better? And do I have the energy and the stamina and the willpower to make that happen? Second, and kind of congruent with the first one is, I ask myself what it is that's really bothering me about the piece or the concept. Sometimes I can pick out an anatomy mistake. Sometimes I notice where values are really off and colors are off. And sometimes it's a little bit less specific and I just kind of feel like the piece I'm creating reminds me too much of an artist who may have inspired the concept and it doesn't feel like enough of my own sort of thing. So there's a lot of places that that can come from. And third is less of a question and more of a decision-making tool. If I'm not in a proper mental state to be able to objectively answer the first two questions, then it's time to take a break. It's time to just stop doing art. And I know that in a world where we have constant feeds of information and we're constantly seeing artists make more and more and more beautiful work, it can feel physically painful to just stop and go, nope, I'm taking a break, I'm stepping away from this, I'm removing myself from the flow of traffic, and it can be really scary because you might think that all you're doing then is setting yourself way behind and everyone's gonna get ahead of you and you're gonna be left in the dust. And maybe you will, but to be honest, the constant noise is constant. It's just going to keep going whether you're there or not. So if you need to take a break, take a break. And that can be, I'm gonna go stop and get some water and I'll come back to this in 15 minutes, which is kind of what I did with this piece. Right around here, I got to a point where I, I was like, ah, I think it's done, maybe it's done, but I wasn't really sure and I knew something was kind of off, but I wasn't sure. So I stepped away from it thinking it was done and I was just gonna be disappointed with it. And when I came back to it after dinner, I was like, oh, I see what's wrong here and I was able to fix it. A lot of the fixing, to be honest, I didn't record because I wasn't, I don't know, I just wanted to get it done and I wanted to work on it quietly and in solitude, but I do have the last few bits to share with you guys when we get there. If you're worried about wasting your art supplies and you're worried that whatever you make won't turn out good and then you will have just wasted something that's potentially expensive on bad art, remember that bad art is important. We need bad art. And art supplies aren't just for making masterpieces, they're for using. They're for expression and learning. And I'm kind of not sure that we can waste them. It's definitely been a big learning experience for me when my kids sit down with me and I've got my professional watercolors out and they really, more than anything in the world, want to mix a color on their own. They want to try activating the paint, they want to try spreading it on the paper, and at first it was really difficult for me because I wanted to stop them from doing that. I wanted to say, no, you can't, but in the end, there are some instances where sharing that moment with them and taking them up into my lap and letting them play with the same things that I'm using, having that memory, having that experience, and sharing that with my children is way more important than worrying about wasting something. And your learning is important too. So as long as it's a step forward and you're able to learn and grow and look at a piece, even if it turns out bad, and say, what did I do wrong? Can I fix it? What's really bothering me about it? Then the supplies weren't a waste, even if you throw the painting in the trash. Another alternative to this mindset shift is you could literally just have a small set of cheap paints or a junk sketchbook that you use when you just need to work something out. So set aside the expensive paints for a little while, get out something cheap and just scribble. Make a mess, get the ideas out. If that's what you need to do, then do it. Okay, I definitely don't want to run out of time and I want to get through all of your questions. So how do I stay motivated to do art? I kind of don't, <laughs> to be honest. If I'm not feeling motivated, if I sit down and I know I should paint something, whether it's for video or Patreon rewards or I want to make new products for my shop and I'm just not feeling it and I'm just not in the proper mental state and I'm not easily able to get there, the art will be bad. The art will not be something that I want. So I either need to say, okay, it's gonna be a bad art time and I'm going to allow myself some time in my junk sketchbook or I'm going to scribble and make some swatches and kind of redirect that artistic energy. But usually for me, when I know that I'm not in the right mental state, when I'm not motivated, I just don't do art that day. I'll work on something else 
or I'll take a break and I feel really fortunate to have the flexibility to make decisions like that. And if you're not a professional artist, you always have that flexibility. You can always say, uh, I was hoping to make art, but I'm not feeling it, so I'm not going to. I mean, there are some people who can push through and their creativity will kind of be bolstered and will surface as they work and if you're that kind of person that's fantastic sometimes you just have to try to figure out if that even works for you it doesn't work for me and that's something that i've kind of had to come to terms with over the past couple years if i really am trying to stir up my creative juices sometimes i will look through notes of ideas i've had for paintings in the past sometimes i will go to pinterest Sometimes I will look at my past work, some paintings that I know I really liked in the past, and try to figure out what it was I loved about them and communicate that in something new. And sometimes I just need to try a new medium. So if I sit down with my watercolors but I'm just not feeling it, I might get out my acrylic paints or my gouache, or even try to set up some oils or just work with ink or pencil sketches. And sometimes just switching up the medium can be really helpful. Along with motivation, someone also asked if art ever feels like a job to me. Because of how I work with motivation and how I kind of try to listen to my creative mind and if I'm just not in a place where I'm ready to create, I don't do that. Art itself doesn't usually feel like a job because I know I can't make work I'm happy with if I'm not excited to create. The job part can definitely feel like a job though. So replying to company emails, budget updates, video processing, editing Skillshare classes, that definitely feels like work a lot of the time. And sometimes I really have to muster up willpower. It's not the same as creative energy, but just willpower to sit down and dedicate the time to getting those things done. A lot of you guys had asked how I make colorful skin tones. This is a big topic that I'm going to be making a dedicated video for later in this month, but I will say if you want the most in-depth answer possible, you can check out my rainbow skin class over on Skillshare. Obviously this video is not sponsored, but I do teach on Skillshare and that's where that class is and I go through lots and lots of details there. For the most part, it boils down to balancing saturation and value. I try to keep my colors overall less saturated, so I'm working in a more limited range within the color wheel, which allows me to explore different hues more while keeping the saturation relatively low, and also I need to have strong values. If my values are strong and my lights are where they should be, my darks are where they should be, if I can take a picture of my painting, put it in grayscale, and it looks right, then I can kind of do whatever I want with the colors. Speaking of colors, my least favorite colors to paint with are like a true purple, like a right in between red and blue purple. Don't like that very much. I'd like it to be very, very close to blue, like a deep, deep blue, or something more dusty and warm and reddish on the other side. But right in the middle, I don't like very much. And also like a leafy green. Not a huge fan of like a, a leafy green. I like a sap green or like a perylene green, but that leafy green, not a huge fan of that. Two questions that I feel like kind of go together is why is my art dark and also am I happy? So I'll kind of answer these together. Um, sometimes my art can be a little dark and falls into sort of that, I don't know, realm. I connect emotionally with vulnerability and the honesty of humanity. That can sometimes get a bit dark. I love fantasy and sci-fi, but I'm also a huge romantic and I feel like the darkness of my work actually stems from a bit more of romanticism than depression. Tugging on heartstrings with love or heartache, something happy or sad, is always special to me. I don't usually make art about my own sadness. It gives that negativity too much power. So if I make art that is sad, it just makes me more sad. It doesn't actually help me feel better. Speaking of which, am I happy? Yes. I feel like I'm living my dream job, to be honest. I'm just living my dream. I do struggle with anxiety pretty regularly, but I'm taking control of that and realizing that I can't just say I have anxiety in most cases. There's usually a cause and changing repetitive environments and unhealthy habits is really helpful. It can be hard to muster that determination when I'm in the middle of a panic attack, so I'm trying to establish a structure while I'm well that I can fall back on when the weight hits me. Speaking of some negativity, you guys asked if I ever get 
mean comments and how do I deal with them. I do get them, and as the channel has grown, the frequency of those comments has grown. It usually feels like they come from people who've found me via one specific video and they don't actually know who I am or the kind of content I make. The more the channel grows, the more that stuff is going to happen. And I have found that the videos that tend to have the most negative reviews are the videos that I feel most negatively about myself. So that was really difficult for me when the comments first started coming in that were negative because I already felt bad and self-conscious about that content. And if I could go back to it, I would do it a different way or I would change things or I would make adjustments. So it was really hard and really heartbreaking for me and really stifling to see the negativity from other people when I was already feeling it myself. But I first have to learn not to take it personally, even though it usually is personal because taking it personally doesn't help. It's kind of like if I'm standing on a street corner and painting and somebody, some random stranger who's walking by just yells at me and then keeps walking. That's what's happening on YouTube most of the time. The people who say negative things, they come in, they say negative things, and they leave. That's usually what happens. And I have to remember how kind of silly that situation is and it helps me to kind of distance myself from the negativity. Sometimes I just ignore it. Sometimes the comments get deleted, especially if they could be hurtful to other people. If I can answer it thoughtfully and patiently and think that it will actually be helpful and informative, I will reply to the comment, but I never reply to a comment to start an argument. And if I'm feeling really lost and really down, I will ask for support from other artist friends, especially other content creators, or from my husband. I'll just go to my husband and tell him that somebody said something mean about me and cry a little bit, and then I'll feel better. <laughs> uh, and on that note, we're like seriously so very out of time. Um, I, 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 I don't know. This has just been the epitome of my rambliness. I hope that I have provided some answers to these questions to you guys. Oh boy, it's been a long one. Thank you so much if you've stuck around. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video and this painting. And uh, I will see you guys in the next one. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. And yeah, okay, okay. I will talk to you later. Bye guys. <laughs>